This week, I came across an interesting concept and it is called frustration tolerance. Okay, this is a term introduced by the American psychologist Albert Ellis in the 1950s. He defines frustration tolerance as the ability to withstand discomfort or challenging situations without, being, without becoming emotionally overwhelmed. Okay, a newborn baby, for example, has zero frustration tolerance. Hungry? Wah, wah, wah. Dirty diaper? Wah, wah, wah. Painful? Wah, wah, wah. Right? The baby feels distressed the moment she experiences discomfort and she expects the frustrating situation to be addressed immediately. And as she grows, the baby learns to accept or at least temporarily tolerate a greater and greater level of discomfort. Okay, and we grow to become mature adults by developing the ability to accept and respond constructively to setbacks and problems. Unfortunately, for many people, the process of growing in frustration tolerance often get derailed over along the way. Some people end up with what is, being, what is described as Low frustration tolerance, uh, LFT for short. LFT refers to an individual tendency to believe that they cannot endure discomfort or hardship. Okay, if you drive, okay, you just have to be one second slow in driving off when the traffic light turns green to discover how many Singaporeans there are with LFT. Albert Ellis explains that LFT often leads to anxiety anger and depression okay, because individuals are unable to handle setbacks and the inability to tolerate frustration worsen our stress and emotional turmoil. Okay, the opposite of LFT is HFT, simple, right? High frustration tolerance. The individuals with HFT accept that while unpleasant situations they are difficult, okay, they are part of life. Okay, they can reduce their stress levels, better manage their emotions, and develop more effective coping strategies. Okay, did you know that the ancient Chinese placed a high value on frustration tolerance? Okay, they call it chi ku. Okay, literally means to eat the bitter, right? Eat bitter. They okay, consider high frustration tolerance to be the ultimate virtue. Okay, complete the sentence, complete the saying, chi de ku zhong ku. Not bad, lah, this survey is a great job, right? If you're willing to take a lot of bitter, you're willing to endure uh, a lot of frustration and hardship, okay, fang wei ren san meaning you, know, you will become, you know, uh, you will be esteemed right, by other people. Frustration tolerance is such, if you think about it, it's such a powerful concept. Okay, our level of frustration tolerance will determine how fulfilled we live in this life while being in a very imperfect world. It will determine how successful we are in overcoming the obstacles that stand in the way of our dreams. It has the direct bearing on our ability to get along with all kinds of people. So, how do we develop high frustration tolerance? Okay, if you search on the internet, they will tell you, oh, you need to learn to accept right, negative situations. You need to practice positive self-talk. Or you need to cultivate mindfulness. Right? Those are the buzzwords these days. But this afternoon, I humbly submit to you that there is no better belief system that can empower you to overcome challenging situations like Christianity can. Okay, in fact, practicing the Christian faith takes you one step further. It not only makes you more resilient, but it also gives you the reason to be joyful. So, oh, is it really possible to be joyful while going through tremendous pain and stress? Okay, that's what we're going to uncover together today. Okay, let's start by reading from Philippians chapter 1. Okay, quite a long passage, but come, stay with me. Starting from verse 12. I want to, uh, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear, that throughout, become clear throughout the whole palace guide and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ of envy and rivalry and by others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by death or, by, or whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is Christ. Gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what should I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Okay, some background to the letter of Philippians. The writer, Paul, wrote this letter when he was under house arrest in the city of Rome, awaiting his trial before Caesar. As Paul's letter was being read out, okay, it was a public circular letter, as his letter was being read out, the Philippians must have listened intently to the latest update of his life because they have heard that he had been in very distressing circumstances. So they held their breath as they listened, preparing to hear even more awful details about him. But Paul Surprise them! He described his problems, but far from trying to solicit any sympathy. He went on and on about rejoicing. Paul was using his own predicament to teach them about the joy of being a Christian. In our passage today, he showed us how it is still possible to have joy in three crucial areas of our lives. Suffering, dying, and leaving. Okay, let's, so, let's start with the first one. Okay, that we can have joy in suffering because it does not matter so long as Christ is preached. The Apostle Paul had a stellar missionary career. He had traveled far and wide. He had won many converts. He had planted many churches. His house, his house arrest, apart from the hardship, also put an abrupt stop to his missionary journeys. But instead of moaning about his uncomfortable situation, instead of venting his frustrations, Paul gave a joyful report to the Philippians. Okay, let's read that again from verse 12. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and that all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Over here, Paul focused on two positive outcomes of his house arrest. Firstly, the people who guarded him, the people who were chained to him, were hearing the gospel from him. His captors became his captive audience. Okay, have you ever had have this experience of going or walking the same way as somebody and this person just keep talking on and on and on against your will? Okay, it was like this for the guards. Right? This, those poor guys who were chained to Paul had no choice but to hear him talk on and on about Jesus Christ and hear his evangelistic sermons day in and day out. In fact, at the end of this letter to the Philippians, he sent greetings from those who belonged to Caesar's household and were God's people. Okay, which means he must have won some of these guards to Christ. The second positive outcome Paul focused on was that the Christians in Rome, they were inspired by his courageous stand. 
and they were emboldened to preach the gospel even more fearlessly. Paul was basically saying, hey guys, don't worry for me. They can imprison me, but they can't imprison the gospel. I'm suffering, but no matter, because the gospel is making good progress. Okay, over here, Paul used a very interesting word in Greek, okay, pro koppen. Okay, the word pro means to go in front. Koppen means to cut or chop down. Okay, it is used to describe, okay, army boys can understand this, right? It is used to describe chopping down a forest so that an army can advance. And Paul is saying that his suffering is clearing the way for the gospel to be preached in places that are hard to penetrate. Not only was Paul suffering the ordeals of house arrest, but he was also experiencing the pain of bitter rivalry from fellow Christians who wanted to stir up more trouble for him. I mean, Paul also got toxic colleagues uh, and office politics as well. And what was his response? Okay, verse 18, he says, But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of that, I rejoice. Help me tell the person on your right. But what does it matter? <laughs> Paul took no pleasure in suffering, nor did he pretend to be strong. Okay? He did none of those. Yet he could rejoice even in suffering because he had a different perspective to suffering. What does it matter as long as Christ is preached? You see, the letter of Philippians alone is enough to totally debunk the prosperity gospel, which is the idea that following God guarantees blessings like health and wealth. Christianity does not offer us exemption from suffering. Instead, it offers us something better. It offers us joy in all circumstances. The basis for our Christian joy is not health, Oh, wealth. Instead, God gives us a big purpose. Okay, now you've been wondering, how does that even help me by having a purpose? You see, if you don't have a big purpose, every problem in your life becomes a big problem. Let me say that again. If you don't have a big enough purpose, every problem in your life becomes a big problem. Okay, your life will be an endless emotional roller coaster. Okay, if you do well in your job, well, up, 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 up. You lose your job, down, 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 down. Found a girlfriend on CMB, well, up, 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 up. Dumped by girlfriend, down, 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 down. Your child does well in school, well, up, 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 up. Your child falls sick, okay, like, like mine, uh, got pneumonia recently, uh, down, 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 down. New baby, wow, up, 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 up. My family member passed away, wow, just downward all the way. Okay, your life will be a roller coaster. Conversely, we can cope with any amount of pain and suffering if we have a big enough purpose. Okay, it does not mean we don't feel pain or sadness anymore when bad things happen, but having a purpose helps us to go through our pain with joy because the purpose puts the suffering in perspective. Many people decide to train for a marathon, even though it involves months of physical pain, muscle aches, exhaustion, and having to wake up early you know, to run in East Coast Park on Saturday, 6 a.m. Right? Our guitarist just now, he does that, right? They do it not just for fitness, but for the joy of achieving a personal goal and overcoming their limits. The pain is worth it because crossing the finishing line represents some, something much bigger than just running. Right, Yuan? What does it matter? I'm going for the finisher medal. Many adults endure a toxic workplace with unreasonable bosses and stressful conditions because they are driven by the goal of supporting their families. Okay, the stress is real. But they push through anyway, knowing that providing for their loved ones and securing a better future is worth the sacrifice. What does it matter? I'm ensuring the well-being of my family. 
Many women willingly endure the intense pain of childbirth because the joy of bringing a new life into the world is worth it. Okay, it is one of the most painful experiences a human being can go through, yet these mothers push ahead because they are driven by the anticipation of holding their newborn baby. What does it matter? I am welcoming a new member into my family. You see, the greater the purpose, the more suffering we can endure joyfully. And to all the followers of Jesus Christ, there is no greater conceivable purpose than the advancement of the gospel. Okay, no, suffering was not part of God's plan. God will one day free us from all suffering. But in the meantime, He is so wise and powerful that He can use even our suffering to advance the gospel in ways that we cannot imagine, in ways that we cannot understand. When we suffer, we can say, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. The second crucial area of our life where we can find joy is in dying because it is better to depart and be with Christ. Now, if you're not a Christian, uh, you might find this so morbid, right? Or, or even cult, like, oh, to say that there can be joy in dying. Okay, after all, we live in a world that sees death as something to avoid or to be feared. Okay, the mo moment someone dies, we cover, up the we cover the body with a sheet to hide it from sight. We embalm the corpse to dress it up so that we cannot see the natural effect of decomposition. We keep the cremated ashes in some isolated places, not at home. We find uncomfortable to say the word die, so we resort to euphemism. <laughs> Departed, passed away, caught home, kicked the bucket, promoted the glory. Right, this way I learned something. Assume room temperature. Uh, so next time, no, tell people, go and die. Tell people, go and assume room temperature. <laughs> and that's just in the English language. <laughs> Back when I was in my first job, one day, uh, one day before I was about to knock off and leave office, okay, I, told my, I told one of my colleagues sitting near me, auntie, uh, quite o much older than me, I told her, 我先上路了. Okay, for those who uh, don't understand, uh, 我先上路了 literally means I will hit the road first. But it's also a euphemism for I'm going to die, <laughs> or I die first. Okay, I said it tongue-in-cheek, right? And I, know, I know that she's not a Christian, I just say tongue-in-cheek, but she was offended by what I said. And she stared at me with a very fierce look. Okay, even though I was referring to myself, I said, 我上路了, 不是你上路了. One time, when I, one time, I typed in my family group chat, right? What's the group chat? 我们可以走了. Right. Uh, literally means we can leave now. Uh, to inform them that we are ready to leave the house. My mother-in-law immediately corrected me in a, in, a, in a group chat saying that I should have said, 我们准备好了. That means we are, already, we are prepared to leave. Right? Instead of saying, uh, we can leave now, which is also, also euphemism for saying, oh, I'm going to die now. <laughs> I was like, oh. So much effort and consideration just to prevent using the word die or, the, or to have this idea of, to prevent saying this idea of dying. The more advanced our society becomes, the more death becomes a taboo because despite all our technological progress, we still cannot prevent death. Okay, billions of dollars are spent every year trying to avoid, resist, or delay the dreaded finality of death, from costly anti-aging treatments to advanced medical procedures like organ transplant and cancer therapies. Okay, people invest heavily in anything that promises to extend life and delay the inevitable reality of death. The universal perspective of all humanity is this, living is better than dying because death is the ultimate joy robber. 
And that is why the Christian perspective on dying is so radical and liberating. Can us read what Paul says again. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Can you help me tell the person on your left? Better by far. Can you realize how radical this statement is? Right? Imagine going to tell our non-Christian friends that dying is better by, better by far than living. Wow, they're going to think that you're suicidal, right? Ask you to go, go and seek help. What gives Christians such a crazy perspective? Okay, let me just give you two reasons by referring to two passages from the Bible. The first one from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then a saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of death is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. By rising from the dead, Jesus demonstrated that He has power even over death. And His glorious promise is that if we trust in Him, we too will have victory over death. We will rise from the dead and we will receive a resurrected body that will never again fall sick, never again grow old, never again die. Dying is better because we are going to exchange this body and this life for something far greater. Okay, this is your body full of aches and pains. Okay, you will one day receive a body that will never decay. It's a body full of cancer cells. You will receive a body that is perfectly strong. It's a body full of fats. I don't dare to say. <laughs> you will receive a drop dead gorgeous body. At the same time, there is something even better than eternal life. It is eternal life in the presence of our Savior. When Jesus was hanging on a cross with two criminals crucified beside him, okay, one of them turned to him and said, okay, Luke 23, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Right? Right? They, they were hanging, they were, all this conversation happened on a cross. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, we experience the greatest joy when we can be close to the person who loves us the most. Nobody loves us more than Jesus Christ who gave his life for ours. Okay, while we get to experience a taste of God's presence in this life, which is a taste, the closest union we will ever experience with him comes only in the next life. Death becomes the transition into our ultimate joy. It is better to depart and be with Christ. Recently, my wife said something to me. She said, I thank God that He has given us such a cute and healthy child. I don't know how I will take it if something bad were to happen to him. So, I immediately sense, okay, this is a meaningful pastoral moment. <laughs> so I responded to her, right, try to pick her mind a bit. I say, actually, if our two-year-old toddler were to die right now, it is probably the best thing that could happen to him. Because he has not yet reached the age of accountability, meaning he's not mature enough to understand his, about his own sinfulness, guilt, and a need for a saviour. God would not hold him accountable for his sins. He would be with Jesus if he were to die. Even though he might leave us now, one day we will be reunited. My wife said, but I'll be so sad. I'll be devastated. <laughs> to which I replied, yes, I will be devastated too. But to be with Christ is better by far. 
Every now and then, I would tell my pastoral colleagues that I don't want to leave so long. Lah. Okay, if you ask me, I'm ready to go now. <laughs> I, can, I can leave anytime. Some of my, uh, co- uh, some of my female colleagues, they will gently rebuke me. Lah. They are a bit annoyed, but they still look at me with a smile. They will gently rebuke me out of love, reminding me that I still have a wife and a child to t- take care. Honestly... <laughs> I don't worry about my family that much. Okay, because if God in His wisdom takes me home, and if He loves my family members more than I do, then surely in His grace and mercy, He will provide for my family. I told my, my wife, a few, this is a few years ago, that I want to record a video message for the people attending my funeral. Right? Welcome to my ascension party. Woo-hoo. And I asked her, right? I, I, gave her, I, gave, I asked her, can you please play this video during my funeral, right? when she executes my, uh, my will? Uh, but until today, she has not quite come around to this idea. <laughs> At my funeral, please don't play sad song, no slow tempo song, only fast tempo praise song. Okay? 150 BPM above. Right. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, maybe my enemies will sing that. Like, I will rejoice and be glad in it. But only fast tempo worship songs. And if you come to my funeral, please don't wear black. Don't, don't. Okay, do it like what the Chinese say. Like, right? Da hong da zi, right? Red and purple only. Okay, maybe some of you right now, you're thinking, maybe, maybe some of you, including Christians, are thinking, wow, you're crazy to think this way. Right? You're insane. And that's only because the Bible says that as followers of Jesus Christ, we do not grieve, we do not need to grieve like those who have no hope. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, we can go through all of life with joy because we already know the ending. Okay, everything is going to be all right, at the end. If it's not all right, it is not yet the end. Okay, to depart and be with Christ is better by far. Finally, Paul tells us the third crucial area of our life is that we can find joy in living because it will mean fruitful labor for us. Okay, if dying is better than living, then why go on living? Shouldn't we just live recklessly, right? close our eyes and drive? Or eat excessively you know, so that we can speed up the process of dying? Sounds reasonable, unless there is a good reason to continue living. Okay, and Paul tells us the reason. Verse 22, If I am to go on living in the body, it will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again, my, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Okay, once again, this is a radically different perspective. Most people hang on to death, uh, hang on to life desperately because they are fearful to die. We Christians prefer to die. <laughs> But we go on living because God still has a job for us here. Paul says he wants to go on living for the sake of the Philippians' progress in the faith. He wants to continue helping the Philippine church to grow in its faith. Okay, notice in Greek, over there, yeah, in Greek, the word for progress is the same as advance earlier on. Okay, pro kopen. Listen to this. If God has not taken you yet, the only reason is that you still have a job to do here. Okay, to advance Pro Koppen, his purpose here on earth. And in particular, to continue building his church. Relocation is a regular feature in the manufacturing industry. Okay, we know this, our operations move up move to places with cheaper labor, plants get shut down, workers get laid off. 
Okay, and often a small group of employees are retained to wind down the operations. Okay, in industry jargon, okay, they are left behind to turn off the lights. Their job is to keep the operation running until the very end. Similarly, and yet in a much greater sense, God has served notice that He is going to shut down all operations here on this earth. All who have believed in Jesus are going to relocate to a better place. In the meantime, God has left some of us here to keep the lights going, keep the operation running until the very end. What will happen on the last day of operation? Okay, Matthew 25 tells us, Jesus tells us this. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Okay, and this gives us a whole new perspective for living. Okay, Paul says he wants to progress with the Philippians so that their joy may be made full. As Christians, we live to bring joy to others. And ultimately, we live to bring joy to our master. Okay, listen to this. If your view on life is primarily about your own enjoyment, the truth is, you won't really enjoy it. Okay, let me say that again. If your view on life is primarily about your own enjoyment, the truth is, you will not really enjoy it. Why? Because you will be constantly worried about whether you are maximizing your life. You'll feel bitter when you see others having what you do not have. You will take failures very badly. You'll be very hard on yourself because you cannot get what you want. You'll feel crushed when bad things happen. When something comes along and shatters your dreams, you'll be crushed. You will not be able to recover. But if you see life not as something for your own enjoyment, but as God's assignment, wow, you will live very differently. If you see life not as your own enjoyment, but God's assignment, you will live life very differently. It does not matter if you have fewer possessions than, the, than those around you. It does not matter if your children do not turn out as successful as others. It does not matter if you cannot secure your dream car, your dream house, your dream job, or the dream physique. What matters is God's assignment for you here on, while, you're, while you're on earth and the reward He gives to those who complete their assignment faithfully. Let me close with this story. In 1921, a Swedish missionary couple named David a severe flood, traveled to the heart of, of Africa to a remote village called Andolira. Okay, the chief would not let them enter the village, so their only contact with the villagers was a young boy who sold them food you know, on, on a regular basis. Severe fl flood decided that if this was the only African she could talk to, she would try to lead the boy to Jesus. And after many weeks of loving and witnessing to him, the boy trusted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Then of all things, Sevilla found herself pregnant in the middle of the primitive wilderness. She gave birth to a little girl called Edgy and died 17 days later due to malaria. David was overwhelmed with sorrow and bitterness towards God. He buried his wife, gave his newborn girl away, and returned to Sweden, saying God had ruined his life. The baby, Edgy, was brought by an Ameri uh, American missionary couple back to the United States where she grew up. In 1963, one day, a Swedish religious magazine appeared in Edgy's mailbox. Okay, and photo inside the magazine shocked her. A grave with a white cross named Severe Flood. The article wrote about missionaries who came to Andolira long ago. Only one little boy was led to Christ. A baby girl was born. The young mother died. And the boy grew up and built a school in a village. Gradually, he warned the students to Christ. 
The children led their parents to Christ. Even the village chief became a Christian. And after reading the magazine, uh, reading the article, Edgy decided to look for her father in Sweden, who had lived in drunkenness and bitterness for many decades. When she saw him, she showed him the article. Papa, you didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. The little boy you both won to the Lord grew up to win the whole village to Jesus Christ. The one seed you planted just kept growing and growing. Today, there are 600 African people serving the Lord because you and Mama were faithful to the call of God on your life. Papa, Jesus loves you. He has never hated you. David's heart softened, and by the end of that afternoon, he returned to God, whom he had, he had resented for so many years. And he died a few weeks later. A few years later, Edgy attended a missions conference in London where a report was given about the African nation her parents went to okay, back, uh, uh, back, uh, back in 19, back so many years ago. The superintendent of the National Church, okay, which, who represented 110,000 baptized believers, spoke about the spread of the gospel in his nation. And she couldn't help herself and asked him afterward if he had ever heard of David, a severe flood. I'm their daughter. The man began to weep. Yes, madam, the man replied. It was a severe flood who led me to Christ. I was the boy who sold food to your parents. In fact, to this day, your mother's grave and her memories are honoured by all of us. You must come to Africa to see because your mother is the most famous person in our history. Edgy did that. She went to Africa and she was welcomed by cheering throngs of villagers. The most dramatic moment was when the pastor escorted Edgy to see her mother's grave. She knelt in the soil to pray and give thanks. Later that day in the church service, the pastor read from John chapter 12, verse 24, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He then followed with Psalms 126, verse 5, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. To my friends who are not followers of Jesus Christ, do you have a belief system about suffering, dying, and living that can bring you great joy? Okay, I humbly I submit to you that only the Christian faith can do that. When you make Jesus the focus and center of your life, you will be able to say, as what the Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In the face of suffering and hardship, you will be able to say, but what does it matter? Between life and death, you can confidently say, to depart is better. Yet, I want to go on living. You can live joyfully because you know that your labor is not in vain. You'll be fruitful. Not only will you be able to bring joy to the people around you, but you, also, you will also bring joy to the heart of your Saviour and Master. And finally, to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, is joy an ongoing reality in your life? Or are you like David Flood was initially, bitter and resentful towards God for the cards that life has dealt to you? Is the joy of the Lord your strength? Or have you allowed the hardships of life to rob you of your joy? You know something? You can do no greater damage to the Christian faith than to be a joyless believer. At the same time, you cannot preach the gospel more powerfully than simply being a joyful Christian.
if you have been weighed down by disappointments or the struggles of life, I want to say to you, okay, what you truly need is not for God to give you a remedy to your problems. Okay, of course, He can do that, and we want to continue to pray for God to do that for you. Okay, but what you truly need is not a remedy to your problems, but a reminder, a reminder to yourself that the ending has already been written. We already know why, how, how, how things are going to be at the end. No matter how imperfect your life is right now, God will one day restore you to perfection. You need a reminder that God has placed you wherever you are for a purpose. He can use even your suffering for His glory. You need a reminder that your labour and your hard work will not be in vain. He will cause your efforts to bear fruit and reward you for your faithfulness when He sees you face to face. Okay, if you're currently serving in church, I want to say to you, <laughs> thank you for your faithfulness. Okay, let's, together, let's press on and persevere until we complete the race. If you're currently not serving in church, I want to invite you to join us. Join us in availing ourselves to be used by God. Okay, together, let's put our hands to fruitful labour. Come, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that, Lord, you have not left us as orphans here on earth. But, Lord, you have put your spirit in us, O oh God. The Lord, you are near, you are close to us. And the Lord, you eagerly desire to have an ongoing, growing relationship with us. I just want to pray for all my brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, you will remind us daily. You will give, you'll just remind us, our souls that God, you have never left us alone. You are with us every step of the way. You remind, I pray that Lord, you will remind us that through all the sufferings, the difficulties in our lives, that God, you still have a purpose. You are still working, oh God. I pray that, Lord, we know that in our moments of struggles, you know, our, our own moments of turmoil and distress, we don't even think about God's purpose. We don't even think about you. We're just so caught up. We are just so overwhelmed by our own emotions. But I want to pray, Lord, in those moments, Holy Spirit, you will, break, you will, you will, give, you will, have, you will break through in our lives. You remind us that, God, that, your, your, that, Lord, you are in control. That even in the most, in the messiest of situation, God, you are able to turn things around. You are able to turn something beautiful out of something broken. You are able to turn good out of bad. I pray that, Lord, in our moments of fears and anxiety, you remind us that, God, the end has already been written. Things are going to be perfect. Things are going to be good. Things are going to be beautiful right at the end. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray you remind us that our hard work, the things that we do for you, they are not in vain. Even though we might not be able to see the results right now, even though we, are, we, are, we encounter disappointments upon disappointments, Lord, you will remind us that our hard work is, are not in vain. That, Lord, you will cause our efforts to bear fruit, and one day, oh God, you are going to reward us for our faithfulness. And I pray that for all of us here, that make it, let, I pray that you will be the goal of our life, that we will look forward to the day that, Lord, we will stand before you face to face and to hear from you, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I pray that, Lord, even as we look forward to that, that, to that day, help us to live every single day of our life with great joy because, Lord, we know that best has yet to come. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.